Greetings and God bless you. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Happy Sunday to everyone who's watching today. Happy first Sunday. God has brought us all this way to the first Sunday in September. And I don't know about you, but I'm elephant happy and hippopotamus glad. We're getting ready to go into our retro worship as we've been doing in the past couple of weeks. So we want you to get ready to sit back, relax, enjoy the worship experience. Also, we're going to get ready to go to the Lord's table. So I, I ask that you would prepare your elements at the end of this worship experience as we get ready to partake in the Lord's broken body and his shed blood. As always, you can always pay your tithes and offerings online. There's some information that's appearing on the screen right now. You can go to the website, uh, click online giving. Also, you can mail your tithes into the church. The address is there on the screen. Please do not bring your tithes and offerings to the campus unless we're doing drive-through communion. Otherwise, the campus is closed until further notice. And then thirdly, you can text to give. There's a number that appears on the screen right there. Dial that number, follow the instructions, and your tithes and offerings will be recorded, received, and God will reward you just the same. Just before we go into the worship experience, I wanna offer prayer to you right now. There may be those of you who are desiring a prayer request. You're more than welcome to call us, to email us, to DM us or, or contact us through any of our social media sites. We'd love to receive your prayer requests and we believe that by faith, your prayer requests will become a praise report. Let's go to the throne of God. God, we come before you now in the name of Jesus. Before we ask you for anything, we want to thank you for everything. We acknowledge that this is the day that you have made and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Now, Father, I pray for those who are watching this right now. I pray that you would meet them at the point of their need. God, somebody needs healing. Somebody needs deliverance. Somebody needs salvation. Somebody needs a breakthrough. Somebody needs an answer, direction. Somebody needs to hear from you. So God, we come right now asking in the name of Jesus that you would touch right now. Meet your people at the point of their need. God, we also ask that you forgive us of our sins by omission and commission. Those things, God, that we did not know we did or that we planned on doing, God. We thank you that you're able to forgive us of all of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, Father, we pray that you would touch our government. Bless now this land and country that we live in. Look down on our government officials, God. Touch them with your favor and your mercy. Give them wisdom and direction and insight on how to lead this country. We pray for every church, every pastor, every ministry that's open in your name, God. Make the church one, even as you and the Father are one. And so, God, we thank you that you hear and answer our prayer. And we, we believe by faith that our prayer is answered and to show you that we trust you and we believe you. We move from prayer into praise. And it is so. And it cannot be otherwise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you and keep you. I'll see you at the end of today's message as we offer Jesus Christ and then we're going to the Lord's table. Until then, I'll see you at the end of the message. God bless you. Somebody give God a praise. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Lord, I'm cognizant that these are your people and I'm cautious as to what I say. So my prayer is that they be blessed by thee and not impressed by me. Make my tongue as the pen of the ready writer to write on the hearts of men things that are vital and necessary for their good success. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine will be done. Speak to us, through us, and for us. And when it is all said and done, we'll be quick and careful 
to give your name the praise, honor, and glory. It's in the name of your Son and our Savior, Jesus the Christ, we pray. And they all said, Amen. Amen. You're probably wondering, why did the brothers open the doors? I promise you, you, you got to know your pastor. There's a method to my madness. Um, can we get those two doors on both sides as well to reopen? There's a word from the Lord today. Deuteronomy chapter 30. To the ministers on the roster. To the officers of this church. To you, my father's children. Grace and peace be unto you from God our Savior, our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. Deuteronomy chapter 30. We're not going to read verse 1 through 19. I just want to preach verse 19. When you have it, say amen. amen. Very familiar passage of scripture, Deuteronomy chapter 30. Verse number 19 from the New International Version says this, This day I call heaven and earth as witnesses against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life so that you and your children may live. I want to preach this passage as locked in a room with open doors. You may be seated. Thank you, Ushers. Locked in a room with open doors. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. In the infancy of my ministry, I was challenged by my seminary professors and teachers to broaden my reading horizon. Not to just read the Bible, but read other books for enhancement, empowerment, and education. So in 1992, my attention was gripped by an unusual satire. There was a publication by Eon Socks called Mask of Love and Life. Within that book, there was a chapter that gripped my attention. The name of the chapter was called Locked in a Room with Open Doors. In that chapter, Socks talks about two brothers. One of them had a phobia of open doors. The older brother who became impatient with the younger brother said to him one day, if you keep bothering me, one day I'm going to lock you in a room with open doors. What a statement to imply. What a thought to ponder. To be locked in a room with open doors. It would suggest my brothers and sisters that that is a potential of being free. Yet a person is not yet free. And my brothers and sisters, may I submit and suggest that there are many of us in the body of Christ. We have the potential to be free, but we are stuck where we are. As I think of that, my brothers and sisters, I think of uh, 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 an organization that is no longer in existence, Brother Buford, Ring Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey Circus. Some years ago, I took my kids there one day, and, one, and, and when I sat there in the circus, the greatest show on earth, I noticed that out of all the lions and tigers and bears, the one act that caught my attention was the elephant. It was not the trick that the elephant did. It was something else that blew my mind. That the elephant, before he did his trick, was standing next to a master that constantly whipped him with a, with a whip. He was tied to a stake that weighed only 10 pounds. The elephant himself weighs over a ton. The elephant who weighs over a ton was incarcerated, cramped, 
hooked up to a chain that's connected to a stake that's only 10 pounds. You're looking but ain't listening. The elephant who is over a ton is incarcerated, captive, held next to a stake that weighs only 10 pounds. Many of us are more powerful than the thing that has us captive. But the problem is we've been so trained to be acquiesced and obedient to the thing when actuality we control what should control us. We have been locked in a room with open doors. May I suggest my brothers and sisters before we go further that if you're going to be successful in the body of Christ you've got to learn how to come out of this locked room that has plenty of open doors. Moses in Exodus in Deuteronomy chapter number 30 is giving his farewell speech. His benedictory address. He's about ready to check out of here. But before he checks out of here from chapter 26 to chapter number 34 he's giving some exhortations. He's giving some, 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 some instructions to the people of God because he knows that this is his last shot to get to them about their hard headedness. They've wandered in the wilderness 40 years. They've gone after idol gods. They've grumbled and they've complained. Some of them at times have committed apostasy, turned away from the faith. The Lord has been telling them through Moses that your blessing is not contingent upon how religious you are, but it is based upon how faithful you are. And most of us need to understand that if we remain faithful to God, God will remain faithful to us. But let me help you out with that. Even if we don't remain faithful to God, he's still faithful to us. Is there a witness here? And so Moses says to them in chapter 30, I'm trying to tell you from verses 1 down to verse number 19 that God has presented some things to us. He's given some stuff to us in order for us to be successful because it is not his will for us to go through this mundane routine where we're with God one day and we're not with him the next. We're hot one day cold the next day and lukewarm any other day. God says, I'd rather you be hot or cold. But because you're lukewarm, that's revelation, I'll spew you out of my mouth. He says, I need you to get to a place where your yeas are yeas and your nays are nays. And while we're looking at, at the children of Israel, there are many of us in here. We talk a good talk. But the kids got a song out right now that says, walk it like I talk it. In other words, if you're going to be on the Lord's side, then be on the Lord's side. If you're going to be saved, don't just be saved on through Sunday, Sunday morning at unity. But everywhere you go, you ought to let your light shine so that men may see your good works. Which side are you going to be on? He says, because if you, if, when I know what side you're on, then I know how to handle you. And so he says in verse number 19, and stay with me in verse number 19, because I promise you I'm not going for it all. If we're going to be locked in a room yes, with open doors, there are several things I want to give you, and I promise we're going to get to the table. The first thing that comes from a lock, a, a, a lock, a room with open doors is it infers a reasonable presentation. It infers a reasonable trans uh, presentation. I'm sitting in verse number 19. Look at what God says through Moses. This day, I call heaven and earth as witnesses against you. Now watch this. God had already been taking care of them. But God says, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to use the celestial and the terrestrial. I'm going to use the carnal and the spiritual. I'm going to use heaven and earth 
earth, watch this, as witnesses not for you, but against you. In other words, I want the world to see that what I'm about to do for you has nothing to do with your power, but it's all my power. And that's why the Lord does what he does in the midst of public people is because if anybody can tell you that God's got his hand on you, surely people that don't know God, because watch this, sometimes you ain't got to broadcast that you're blessed. People who don't go to church and who are not saved, they may not know how to define it, but they know that there's something on your life. You don't walk like them. You don't talk like them. You don't act like them. You don't, re you don't live like them. And God says, that's why I use this against you, because if I'm blessing you any other way, I'm doing it in front of people that don't know me. It's a tragedy for God to bless us publicly and we don't live right publicly. Talk back to me if you can. It's a tragedy for God to be good to us and we're not good to God. It's a tragedy for God to not be ashamed of us and yet we're ashamed of him. But I wish I had somebody here who could say like the old saints, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. I ain't going to make it shine. Just go let it shine. In other words, let me, uh, you, you, you want to let me give you a Bible, Matthew 5 and 16. Let your light so shine that men may see your good works and glorify your Father. Is there anybody here who can say, God, you don't have to worry about me showing who you are to people because if you've been good to me publicly, I got to live for you publicly. I call heaven and earth as witnesses against you. I call heaven and earth as witnesses against you. If, if, if nobody else can attest, heaven and earth can attest that I have presented something to you. Now, 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 Pop, here's, here's what I love about God. God right here is taking the form of a salesperson. He's throwing a pitch towards Israel. He says, here's the pitch. I set before you two things. In other words, you got options. <laughs> Here's the option. You can either have life or you can have death. You can have blessings or you have curses. Watch this. That, 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 word, that word life in the Hebrew is kayi. It's when we get the word maintenance or merriment or, 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 or vitality. You can have vitality. That, that, that is the option. You can, if you choose life, you can be merry. You can be, um, you can be splendorous. You can be uh, prosperous. You can be healthy. You can be on the upside. But you can also choose death. Yeah. Death death in the Hebrew is maveth. It's where we get the word vilification. That word vilification, it literally means to be libel. Yeah. Okay. Now, if death means libel, well. life means asset. Yeah. Which means you can either be an asset yeah. or you can be a liability. Yeah. And what God is saying to us is, it would benefit you more if you were an asset rather than a liability. Because if the truth be told, most of us don't want to admit it, we are a liability not to anybody else, we're a liability to ourselves. Talk back to me if you can. Most, some people, not y'all, some people do like 45, want to blame everything on everybody when the problem ain't Kim Jong-un, it ain't the folk in Libya or Syria, the problem is the person that you see in the mirror, and I know most of us just shut down about what I just said, but if the truth be told, the problem is not your mama, it's not your daddy, it's not your baby daddy, it's not the white man, it's not the folk in McNair, it's not the people on your job, it's the person that you see in the mirror. No wonder Papa used to say, it's not my mother. It's not my father. It's me, O oh Lord. 
So since God is the sovereign judge, he uses this jurisprudence. He brings heaven and earth as what is. He said, I said before you, an asset or a liability. This is the choice you have. You ain't, ain't no in between when it come to God. You cannot straddle the fence. You can't be a saint on Sunday and a hellion Monday through Saturday. Y'all got crying. You can't be a Christian on the first Sunday, but don't know God second, third, fourth, and fifth. Talk back to me if you can. You can't say you love God that you've never seen and hate your brother you see every day. Bitter water and sweet water can't come out the same fountain. Y'all ain't talking back to me. Either you're going to be a Christian or you're not going to be one at all. And you wonder why some folk don't get saved it's because they don't see Jesus in us. Now you might as well say amen because it ain't going to get no better. Mahatma Gandhi said something and it, and, and it blew my mind. Mahatma Gandhi said something on one occasion. He said, I wouldn't mind being a Christian if they ever saw one. Let that sink in for a moment. And that is the language of the world today. They see us go to church, but they don't see us act like the Christ of the church who would we go to. But when your suit comes off and the Sunday school book is closed and the cross comes from around your neck, can they still see Jesus in you even when you don't have your fish bumper sticker? Can they see Jesus in us when we stop speaking in tongues? Can they see Jesus in us when we ain't talking in, in church language? Can they see Jesus in us? Here's the option. Life, death. Blessings, curses. I give you a reasonable presentation. Ain't nothing deep about it. Either you're going to live or you're going to die. But if you, whichever way you respond, God does something in the text that blows my mind. He implies, number two, a rhetorical preference. I'm sitting in verse number 19. He implies a rhetorical preference. Because in verse number 19, he said, here's the offer. Life or death. Now I'm not going I'm not going to force you to choose one. Um, I'm not going to force you to choose the one I want you to choose. But in case you were wondering which one I want you to choose, let me just tell you. Choose life. Is that what your Bible says? He says now, now watch this. We will think that God is constraining Israel. He says, no, I'm not going to make you do something you don't want to do. All right, that's right. If you're going to choose life, then choose life. Yes. If you're going to choose death, choose death. Yes. What I want you to do is choose life. What now, 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 here, here's what it's like, y'all. Here's what it's like. It, it's kind of like uh, I grew up with my big mama during the day. If you grew up with your big mama, grandma during the day, you know that uh, big mama and them during the day used to watch Price is Right. <laughs> Still do something. So they try to put you to sleep so they can watch Bob Barker, you know. And, and, but I, I woke up long enough to watch Bob Barker and the price is right, going somewhere. Now, when the game would come on and they call a contestant down, they get the right price and all of that. You know, um, during the game, it is the contestant's choice on what the right price is. But the, but the contestant is not by themselves. They got a crowd behind them telling them what they think they should do. And what you don't realize is that yes, you've got a choice, but there's somebody who's working you to make the right choice. And he's not by himself. Don't you hear the right in Hebrews chapter 12 say, Wherefore, seeing we are so encompassed about with such a greater cloud of witness, you got to go to Hebrews chapter 11 and know who I'm talking about. You got Moses up there cheering you on. You got Abraham up there cheering you on. You got Isaac and Jacob cheering you on. You got Nehemiah, Obadiah, Zephaniah, Haggai, all of them cheering you on. They can't make you do the right thing. They're just cheering you to do the right thing. 
God said, I can't make you do it. But let me tell you what I think is best for you. Choose life. Now, a normal salesperson wouldn't do that. But God said, I'm not a normal salesperson. I'm trying to make, I'm trying to get you what works best for you. And if we, if God is the right salesperson, then we have to be the right person to ask the right questions. Kind of like when, 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 when you go to a restaurant, like me, when I go to a restaurant and uh, the waiter or waitress is telling me what's on the menu, I ask them, what do you like? Because please don't sell me something that, come on, help me, that you don't like. And, and some of us in here are wondering where you're going with that pastor. The reason why God is preferring life because he himself is life. He wants you on his team. He wants you in his corner. And God said, I'm not looking at what's just best for me, but I'm also looking at what's best for you. And some of us can't appreciate God looking out for us because it don't cater to our flesh. But God said, I got to get you out of your flesh and in your spirit. Because once you're in the spirit, you'll say like Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane, nevertheless, I need about 10 of y'all in here who can say my flesh don't like it, my carnal man don't want it. But if God wants that for me, then God's will be done. Choose life. Choose life. That's that's what I want for you. Choose life. In case you want to know where God stands on the issue, God is pro life. In case you want to know where He stands on it, He is pro life because life mm, don't start when a man and a woman get together. I need somebody to help me. Don't you hear him having a conversation with Jeremiah? Didn't he tell Jeremiah before? I need a Bible reader here. You were conceived in your mother's womb. I knew you. And I ordained you. And God is saying to you, life didn't start when you went to college. It didn't start when you found out who your mom and them was. But before you were inkling or twinkling in your daddy's eye, God already had your plans mapped out. I know the thoughts I have toward you. What are the, what are the God? Thoughts to prosper you and not to harm you, to give you a future. Here it is, and an expected end. God don't just want the, 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 the normal for you. He wants what's best for you. And sometimes the best for you, you may not like this, sometimes the best for you is you got to be lied on, talked about, called everything but a child of God. Sometimes you got to lose family, you got to lose friends, you got to lose money. Sometimes it looks like you're losing your mind. But if God has his hand on you, he's not going to put nothing on you that you can't handle so that when you do come out of it you will realize the devil meant it for evil but God meant it for my good choose life but you're saying Lord you're telling me to choose life so let me ask this question why should I choose life and God is saying like some preacher that I heard God said to them, you're asking all the right questions. He said, let me show you why you should choose life. Which leads me to my last point, and I'm done. That when you choose life, it will, number three, it will impact a receiving posterity. Stay there right there, Tori. Keep it right there. It will impact a receiving posterity. I'm at verse 19. He says, choose life, watch this, so that you and your children may live. Watch this. Some of us in here are so selfish. Not you, your pew partner. 
They think that they're grown. They do whatever they want to do. Ain't nobody going to check them. And they don't have to worry about repercussions. But everything we do has a repercussion for people coming behind us. I need somebody to talk to me here. You can't just do what you big and bad enough to do and don't think it affects somebody. Because again, while you think you ain't doing something and you ain't being watched, somebody is watching you. Some of our own children don't want to go to church because of how we talk about folk in the church. You looking but ain't saying nothing. They see us on the telephone, I mean the telephone, talking about what's wrong with the pastor, what's wrong with the choir, what's wrong with the deacon, what's wrong with the church, and then you wonder why they don't want to come to church. It's because of the decision you made to open up your mouth instead of praying for folk. You might as well say amen. All that time you spent on the phone talking about what's wrong with folk, you could have spent time praying for them because you go to the same church too. If you got an hour to gossip about what's wrong with somebody, you got an hour to pray for them. Everything we do, y'all see you got mad now, okay. Everything you do affects not only you, it affects somebody else. Me and my wife had this conversation just the other day that the decisions I made before my children were born are now affecting them right now. And why are you looking at me? Some of us are mad with ourselves. Because our children don't act like nobody else except us. Y'all ain't saying nothing here. I know you want it, you don't want to admit it, you don't want to deny it, but some of the worst whippings you ever gave your kids is because of the way they act. Mm. And they get their behavior, God. For behavior is learned by people that they watch. And so I got to be careful what I say in front of my five-year-old. I ain't got nobody helping me here. Not only kids, but you got to be careful what you say in front of sinners. Because your foolishness can cause somebody else not to want to know Jesus. Because they say, if that's how church folk act, why I want to go to church? Why I want to live for Jesus? You and I are the only Bible some people ever read. And so he says, choose life, watch this, so that you and your children, watch this, may live. So when you make the right decision, when you come out of this locked room with open doors, not only will God bring you out, <laughs> but he'll bring your seed out as well. Have I got a witness here? He says, but not only that, not only that, but there are certain things you do when, when, when you obey the Lord. The first thing is, it's, I'm in verse number 20 now. He says, you will love the Lord. You will listen to his voice. And you'll be one with him. Love the Lord, that's devotion. Listening to him, that's direction. And then you will hold fast to him. That's linking up with him. In other words, when you make your decision to choose life, you're saying that I love the Lord. That's, that, that, that's my devotion. Then I'm going to listen to him. No matter what he says, whether I like it or not, I'm going to listen. 
Let me help you. Don't shut God out just because you don't like what he told you. Because we got to take the good and the bad. You never know what's, what's, what's wrong with you until the doctor gives you a prognosis. No pro prognosis, no prescription. And we want a prescription without a prognosis. But you can't get a prognosis or a prescription unless you go to the doctor's office. Are y'all listening to me here? He said, you got to love the Lord. I'm done. Listen to his voice and hold fast to him. I'm done. He says, for the Lord is your life. Here it is. And he will give you many years. I'm in, I'm in 20 now. That he swore to give your fathers. Watch this. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Here's, here, here's why you can't shout. Here's why you should, but you're not. It's because your obedience breeds expectancy. I'm preaching better than y'all saying amen when you obey God then you have to expect from God which means God ain't done what he's going to do yet but because you obeyed him you believe and you expect that someday soon God's going to do what I expect him to do Okay, Let, I, I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. Jemaya, you could probably help me out with this. But uh, uh, for, you're not old enough to know, but 14 years ago, uh, Disney and Pixar uh, created a movie called The Incredibles. Okay, now uh, in The Incredibles, you gotta watch the movie. Not two, one. In, in, in part one, uh, towards the beginning of the movie, Mr. Incredible is getting home from work, his secular job. He's frustrated. He's mad, not just at the job, but at the car. Mr. Incredible picks up the car. And while he's picking up a car, there's a little boy on the tricycle. Blew his mind. He put the car down, went in the house. The next day, scene two, Mr. Incredible comes home from the same job. Same frustration, same fatigue. He gets out the car. And before he can go in the house, he looks and there's that same little boy. He looks at the little boy and says to the little boy, what are you waiting for? He said, I don't know. Something amazing. Mr. Incredible goes in the house. Fast forward towards the end of the movie. Yeah. Mr. Incredible with all of his family. They've done some heroic work. You see explosions. You see rescues. You see fights. You see all of that good stuff. Watch this. Which happens in the front yard of the home of the Incredibles. Once the fight is over. Once the explosions are over. Once the rescue is done. Mr. Incredible in his uniform. Turns around and there is that little boy on his tricycle and he hollers out that was totally wicked you miss what I said at first he was expecting Mr. Incredible to do something he didn't see nothing but the more he stood there and waited on Mr. Incredible sooner or later something amazing happened some of y'all in here waiting on God to do something it's been taking two months to happen. It's been taking five months to happen. And you don't know when God's going to do it. But you've been faithful to God. You've been obedient to God. You've been walking with God. And you don't see it yet. But I come to tell you, you got to go back to that. you got to read Isaiah. Isaiah says, has thou not known? Has thou not heard? The everlasting God, creator of the ends of the earth, he fainteth not neither is he weary there is no searching of his understanding he giveth power to the faint and to them that have no might he increases strength even the youth shall faint and be weary young men shall utterly fall here's a shout to him but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength they shall mount up 
with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Is there anybody here who's been trusting God? who have been holding on and it looks like God ain't come through. All I got to tell you is time is filled with swift transitions. Not on earth a new can stand. Build. Have I got a witness here? Build your hopes on things eternal. Hold to God's unchanging hand. Won't he walk with you? Won't he talk with you? Won't he guide your feet? Won't he hold your hand? Have I got a witness here? I need somebody here who's been waiting on God, but it ain't come through yet. Help me close this sermon. If you're not to me to do it, take a neighbor by the hand, pull them close to you, and say, neighbor, I don't know how, how long you've been waiting. Tell them, say, neighbor, I don't know how long you've been waiting. The neighbor, hold on a little while longer. Help is on the way. Won't he do it? Won't he do it? Ain't he all right? Ain't he all right? Say it! sitting there waiting on it but that's not what you're supposed to do but while you're waiting Job said it like this if a man dies shall he live again in all the days of my appointed time I'm going to wait till my change come but I'm not just going to sit here but while I'm waiting I'm going to lift up my hands while I'm waiting, I'm going to praise his name. While I'm waiting, I'm going to give him the glory. Is there anybody here? Have you made up your mind? While I'm waiting on him, give me some room. I've got to give him praise. Give me some room. i got to give him glory. Ain't it all right? I dare you to praise him. I dare you to praise him. Say it. I've set before you life, death, blessings, curses. The choice is yours. Choose life. It's not the will of don't be a liability. Be an asset. But say, preacher, who am I an asset to? You'll be an asset to yourself. You'll be an asset to your seed. And you'll be an asset to the Savior. The one thing the devil don't want you to do is say yes to Jesus. Because you've been an asset to Satan for so long. He don't want to lose his best workers. But I got some witnesses in here that Satan showed enough man with me. Because I remember what I used to do. And now that the Lord has saved me, the same passion I had for what I did in the streets, I do it now for the Lord. And I ain't perfect, but I know God using me. And if he does, and if he can use me, he can use you too. But he ain't gonna force you. You gotta come willing. That's my invitation to you today. If you wanna be used by God, he can use you today. 
Well, I hope and trust you were blessed by today's word today. There might be somebody who's watching me that may want to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. If you're watching me today and you'd like to accept the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible simply says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. It's the simplest praying a prayer. Won't you, if you want to be saved and accept Jesus Christ, repeat this prayer after me and pray it with you, pray it with your mouth and believe it with your heart. Pray after me. Father, I come to you a sinner. I repent of my sins. Forgive me. Save me. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He died for my sins and rose from the grave. Now, Father, fill me with your Holy Spirit. Lead me, guide me, and I'll live for you the rest of my life. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen. Friend, if you prayed that prayer, welcome to the body of Christ. You are now a born-again believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the second step to that is this. Find you a Bible-believing, Bible-teaching church. If you can't think of one, I know one. There's a church in Baytown where everybody is somebody. However, if you're not, if you're because of the pandemic and you would like to become a part of this church, we are Unity Unlimited. That means wherever you are, wherever you are, we would love to receive you as our brother and sister in Jesus Christ. There are three ways you can do so. Number one, you can call the church, 281-426-4223. Please leave your name, your number, your address, your email, we'll be in touch with you. Also, you can call, you can email us at unitybaytown at gmail.com. Again, that's unitybaytown at gmail.com. Please leave your name, number, address, email. Somebody will get in touch with you. Or if you're watching us on any social media site, please hit us in the DM. Inbox us, direct message us, however you can. Contact us, let us know on our social media sites. You can hit us up on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, any of those social media sites. We'd love to connect with you. Please give us your name, number, information, and someone will be in touch with you soon. We look forward to having you as a part of this wonderful church where everybody is somebody. You can come by Carter Letter, Christian Experience Candidate for Baptism. Or you said, Pastor Williams, I would like to join another church. Guess what? If you contact us, we'll send you whatever church you want to go to, no matter where it is. Our motive is to make sure that you go and grow in the Lord and to develop to be the disciple that the Lord Jesus wants you to be. That's all we want to do. So whatever your, your pleasure is, whether you would love to join this church or any other church, just hit us up. Contact us and we'll be happy to direct you in the way that the Lord wants you to go. We look forward to hearing from you. It's the first Sunday. And on the first Sunday, we gather here at the Lord's table to take of the Lord's broken body and of a shed blood. If you have your elements, I pray that you would prepare them now. Let's prepare to partake of communion through the Lord's Supper. Hallelujah. That night in which the Lord Jesus Christ was betrayed, he gave his disciples something new to do. He was getting ready to leave this earth, but he said, before I do that, I have to give you something to remember me by. There are two ordinances we celebrate here at Unity. One is water baptism, where a person goes into the water not to be saved, but it is a testimony that they're already saved. To us, it is a prerequisite for the second ordinance, which is communion or the Lord's Supper. Jesus left these elements for us to do until he comes back. But the Apostle Paul told us, while you're doing so, make sure that you do an inventory on yourself. Evaluate yourself. He says, each one of us ought to check ourselves because we don't want to discern the Lord's body. We don't want to do damage to ourselves. We don't want to eat and drink damnation to ourselves because we disrespect the Lord's body. So it's time for self-examination. As we get ready to partake the Lord's broken body and shed blood, let us talk to the Lord and consecrate ourselves and consecrate these elements as well. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this opportunity to come before your table. Thank you, Lord, that you saved us, you washed us, you filled us with the blood of Jesus. Now, Father, as we prepare to partake of this broken body and shed blood, touch our hearts 
If there's anything in us that's not like you, God, create within us a clean heart. Renew within us the right spirit. Restore unto us the joy of our salvation. God, and as we do so, consecrate these elements, God. Transform them from their natural use to their spiritual symbolism. And as we eat and drink, we drink and eat with celebration until you come back. And it is so. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. That night in which the Lord Jesus Christ was betrayed, he took bread and broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take heed, this is my body, which is broken for you. As often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. Let's eat together. And he took the cup and he gave it to them and said, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, shed for the remission of many. As often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. My brothers and sisters, let us drink together. For as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we do show the Lord's death and his suffering until, we come, until he comes again. We look forward to seeing you this Wednesday in Bible study for Wednesday with God. We pray that you have a wonderful week. Have a happy Labor Day. Be safe. Be secure. We're praying with you. We're praying for you. We love you. We miss you. And until the next time, the Lord bless you and keep you is our prayer.